We as content marketers have an interesting set of challenges. We have a tidal wave of content that we are trying to create and an even bigger one that we as consumers are trying to consume. IBM calls this problem the 4V problem. We have four problems with content marketing today that we need to address. The first is a volume problem. How much content are we creating? Uh, just to give you a sense of how much data and, and, and content and stuff there is, in the world right now, in 2018, which is roughly about here, we are creating about 30 zettabytes of data as a civilization. Everything from the laptop to the, the, the Twitter tweeting you're doing right now to the sensors in your home, all that is 30 zettabytes of data. A zettabyte is a really big number. It's hard to get your, your brain around. Imagine a single Netflix movie. Right? It is about a gigabyte in file size. If we turned one gigabyte into a brick, a physical brick. Uh, the amount of data we're producing every day would build 14 Great Walls of China per day. That's how much data we're creating. That's how much stuff there is digitally. And it's only going to get worse, significantly worse. Within seven years, it's predicted that just the data from your smart sensors, building sensors, and things like that. The Internet of Things is going to create 120 zettabytes of data on its own. That's not including what we, the humans, do, but what just the machines are doing. So we have a tremendous volume problem ahead of us. We next have to deal with the variety problem, the amount of content, the, the diversity of it that we have to create, we have to analyze, we have to understand. This is a fun chart. Uh, what happens in 60 seconds on the internet. And the numbers are astounding. In 60 seconds on the internet last year, 70,000 man hours of Netflix watch. This year, 266,000 hours watch. That is a lot of Netflix and chill. We have 16 million, we know who left. <laughs> 16 million text messages last year, 18 million this year, 990,000 swipes on Tinder last year, 1.1 million per 60 seconds this year. I'm guessing mostly left. But that is, a tremendous, <laughs> that is a tremendous amount of data in all these different formats. These different formats are what we have to deal with. It's not just spreadsheets. It's a whole variety of content. Our third problem is a velocity problem, how fast the content is coming at us. Out of curiosity, how many of you also have, work with like your communications and PR team? A few, oh, wow, most of them. All right, how many of you have ever sent out a press release? OK, so you can stop doing that. Here's why. Someone born, someone who's graduating from college this year, was born in 1997. They saw in that year 3.6 million news stories. This year, we are on track to about 100 million news stories. That's 200,000 news stories per day. If you get a front page hit on, say, the New York Times, or uh, you're featured on stage at Content Marketing World, you are still one of 200,000 things that people, it's just the news alone that people are trying to pay attention to. 9,000 press releases a day. So that press release that you paid $1,200 for, you may as well just stop doing that and just save that budget and go drinking with it. And finally, we have a veracity problem. How truthful is our data? And we're not talking just fake news. We're talking data that misleads us. If you were to use uh, Google Maps a number of years ago, this is, uh, Google has since fixed this bug, but, and asked to say, how do I get from, say, Topeka, Kansas to Tokyo, Japan? At one point, Google would have told you, kayak across the Pacific Ocean. <clears throat> this is a bad idea unless you're really, really, really athletic. But think about your own data, your own experiences. When you're looking at data within your own systems, how misleading is it? Can you tell? Do you know whether you're working with good data or not? Do you know whether you're making sound conclusions or not? The consequences of doing it wrong are hilarious and sometimes epic failure. Uh, we create content that is tone deaf. We create content that frustrates the living daylights out of our users. And we create content that doesn't fit customer needs. So how do we go from creating boring content to creating stuff that people actually want? The general solution, unsurprisingly, since you're in this room, is artificial intelligence, which offers three promises, acceleration, accuracy, and automation. Acceleration is no surprise. AI is all about math. It's math and statistics. Machines are much better than that at us. They can go faster. So anything that we can use in the AI realm to take numeric-like things 
we feed them to the machines instead of us doing it, it goes faster. If anyone's ever watched, say, at a, an ad agency or a content marketing agency, some poor intern or coordinator copying and pasting from spreadsheet to spreadsheet, that's a task that can go a lot faster. The second benefit, of course, is accuracy. Again, math and statistics is the foundation of AI. And so, the, again, we as humans, not so good at math compared to our machine brethren. And of course, the third benefit is automation. The more we can offload to machines, the more time we can spend doing the things that we're actually good at. So what is artificial intelligence? You're in the AI room. You've probably been to a couple other sessions already. What is this thing? It is, in short, trying to get machines to do what humans do naturally from a, a task perspective. If you look at how humans develop, we begin early life with basic inputs, basic processing. We evolve to things like language and, and general understanding, and then we end up with higher cognitive function. By the way, as the parent of a teenager, I appreciate the fact that cognitive function drops off when they hit 13. <laughs> we want machines to do the same thing. We want machines to start with statistics and algorithms, evolve to machine learning, go to deep learning, and eventually get to what's called general purpose AI, which is when a machine becomes a sentient, self-thinking entity. That's not for a while. When it is, run. All AI begins with statistics and probability. How many people love statistics and probability? OK, for everyone who did not raise your hand, you should at least get, develop a begrudging like for it, because this is the, the foundation of machine learning, of, of AI. Once you have stats and probability, you develop algorithms. And we use algorithms every day. As a marketer, you have undoubtedly used A-B tests. For example, that is a set of algorithms. But you do this every day. I'm going to guess probably you put the same general article of clothing on first in the morning. It's like some people put their pants on first, some people put their shirts on first. You brush your teeth uh, first, maybe you shave first. Whatever the order is, you have an algorithm. You have a repeatable, um, scalable process for doing things. That is the, what AI is built on. This is where old software stopped. Old software, you write the code, the machine then spits out the data. When we get to machine learning, it's the reverse. Machine learning is when we take data and train a machine to, to write its own code, essentially, and, do, and then work with future data sets. There are a few different types of machine learning, so we'll look at a few of these. Imagine you had a table full of blocks. What are the different ways that you could work with these? <clears throat> One branch of machine learning is called supervised learning. Supervised learning means we want to train the machine to recognize something. This is the color red. right? And we would feed images like this to the machine over and over and over and over again. When we're talking in the specifically about content marketing, maybe it's recognizing sentiment, for example. Teach the machines over and over and over again that sometimes uh, the, the phrase WTF, but sometimes the phrase WTF generally means a bad thing. right? So we would, we would train it. And the most famous example of this is IBM Watson. In 2015, I think it was, uh, IBM Watson was working with the University of Tokyo's oncology center and was working with a woman who had leukemia. She, they were treating her. She wasn't getting better. She was getting worse. What ended up happening was uh, they fed her genome, uh, her sequence genome to Watson, and 233,000 oncology journals, Watson processed the data, did supervised learning to identify, is this the right treatment? Are we looking for the right thing? And it found out they were treating the wrong type of leukemia. They were treating her for something that was not going to be effective. So they changed the treatment. She made a full recovery. What's interesting about this is not that a machine did this, but that Watson did it in 11 minutes. The second type is unsupervised learning. Again, imagine that table full of blocks, right? And we've trained it maybe to look for a certain type of block, but maybe we want to understand how, what are the different ways we could work with these blocks. We could look at them as in colors. We could look at them as shapes. We could look at them as sizes. You and I can do this pretty easily, right? This is, what, 10, 15 blocks on a table? Imagine this room filled with these blocks. Right? It would take a lot longer. Imagine this convention center. That's uh, unsupervised learning lets us process a lot of data very, very quickly. For example, I was playing around um, and I needed to turn uh, 71,000 paragraphs of text into uh, an understanding of what was in the text. And just with software on my laptop, it spit it out, a chart out in less than five minutes. We see applications like this in content marketing all the time. What are the topics somebody's writing about? What are the topics our competitors are writing about? What are the video, what are the top images being shared on Instagram? Unsupervised learning helps us process this and understand it at a much greater scale. 
Machine learning, like I said, is mostly math and statistics. These are a few of the algorithms that you can use. Clustering, decision trees, k-means regression, linear regression, logistic, naive Bayesian, and so on and so forth. It's all stats. It's all math. If you learn the math and you learn the concepts, machine learning becomes very, very straightforward. Not easy, but straightforward to understand because you understand, like, I know what a frying pan is for. I know what a spatula is for. I know what a pair of tongs is for. Once you understand that, you can work with specialists, work with agencies, or develop the skills yourself to cook, essentially. The third branch is what's called deep learning. And this is when you take individual machine learning algorithms and, and, and ideas and, and architectures and chain them together, link them together. The net outcome when you do this is machines that think like us, but much, much faster, better, and cheaper. How many of you out of curiosity use Google Translate, the Google Translate app, either on your phone or the desktop? Okay, a lot of you. Uh, how many of you have been using it for at least two years? Okay, did you notice about a year and a half ago it got substantially better? Here's why. Google used DeepMind, which is their deep learning system, and, sa and fed all 130 languages that it knew into DeepMind and said, you figure out how to translate. And so through hundreds of layers, what Google found was there was a meta language underneath all of our individual human languages that the machine could essentially work with. So now when you translate from English to Dutch, it doesn't go English to Dutch, it goes English to Google to Dutch, or Spanish to Google to Korean. And so this meta language, by the way, for those of you who are biblical scholars, this is reverse engineering the Tower of Babel. This may or may not be a good idea. Um, but in doing so, it creates a better representation of language than any human effort to write translation software ever could have developed. So when we're talking about machine learning, it looks like this. We start with statistics. We build algorithms. We then move to machine learning, where they choose the algorithms, and then deep learning, where we're chaining all these things together. This is the architecture of AI. This is important for you to know, because when you go down to the expo floor, Every bloody vendor on that floor is saying, we've got AI in our product. Like, cool, what kind? Tell me how it works. Is it supervised? Is it unsupervised? Does it use Bayesian regression? What's under the hood? Some companies are full of what the Spanish would call uh, excremento de toro. Um, <laughs> those who speak Spanish, congratulations. Um, others are the real deal. But by knowing and understanding this, you can evaluate vendors better, and you can also direct your own teams better. What is AI good at? Former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld said in a briefing a number of years ago that we, you know, there are the known knowns and the unknown unknowns, and people kind of made fun of him at the time, but it's a really good way of thinking about artificial intelligence. The known knowns, we know what we know. We know the data, we know the quality of the data, we know the problem we're trying to solve. AI is excellent at this. Again, acceleration, accuracy, automation. This is where AI is best at. When we don't know what we know, for example, if you're in a company and you have enormous numbers of silos, rigid silos between departments, you don't know what you know. You know it's there, you, but sales doesn't let marketing see the data, marketing doesn't talk to PR, PR doesn't talk to accounting. You have unknown unknowns. AI can solve some problems, but it's not going to uh, transform your business. That's more of a data science function. The same is true of this, of the known unknowns. We know what we don't know. We know we need data for X, Y, and Z. We got to go get it. We got to go create it. We got to go measure it. That's, again, more of a data science function. And finally, the unknown unknowns. We don't know what's going on. We don't, we don't know what we don't know. This is where, thankfully, everybody in this room will still be employed because this is what we do as humans, is, is be truly creative, explore, understand, try and figure things out, come up with new ideas. That's where we still have a future and why machines will not be just terminating you at your desk immediately. So what are some practical applications of this? What are some tools there's four sets of tools that apply very well to content marketing. Driver analysis, time series forecasting, unstructured t data mining, and conversation. So let's look at a few of, of these tools. Let's look first at driver analysis. Driver analysis is when you have an outcome you care about and a whole bunch of data that you're not sure whether it matters or not. When you feed this data to a machine learning software, it does Technically, it could either be random forest or multiple linear regression with subset analysis. Either way, what it does is it says what things actually matter in the data. So if I put together all these columns, say you, you publish tweets and emails and content and video and audio and a podcast, and you go to trade shows, you have all these different things, and you care about sales. You would feed 
a machine learning algorithm this and tell you, hey, this combination of variables seems to have the strongest mathematical relationship to that sales thing you want. It, it, this is called attribution analysis. Machine learning powered attribution analysis is extremely powerful. I did this for a blog called Spin Sucks and looked at their, uh, their outcome was lead generation. And it, by using machine learning, we evaluated that actually organic search was only the third most powerful driver. They were focusing a lot of time and energy on it, and they should. That's still important. But email was the number one driver. It was the thing that mattered the most. So when you do attribution analysis with machine learning, you can figure out where you should spend your time in content marketing and where's a waste of time. Waste of time. You know, Facebook referrals here, socialracemedia.com, whatever. I mean, that's, yeah, that's OK, but it, this does not look like this. So prioritization. Another application of machine learning in the foundation stage is being able to connect different data sources and understand what's going on in them. This, uh, I've been sharing these last few days on the CM World hashtag. This is a map of who is the most talked about people at Content Marketing World. Not who does the most talking, not who, do, who has the most followers, but who has been talked about the most. This is super important because if you're trying to do things like influencer marketing, you care about who does everyone else look up to? That I, so I want my, my product in the hands of, say, like a Drew Davis or an Ann Hanley because if she shares it from her stage, if she shares it on her blog, because everyone else is talking about her and everyone else is paying attention to her, I stand a much greater chance of being recognized than sharing it with somebody like whoever this poor soul is. In your own influencer marketing, using machine learning can drastically level up the amount of uh, success you have by identifying what's really important. Again, driver analysis, what's really important. Thank <laughs> you.